the x-ray is probably the most valuable tool you have in your armamentarium other than the MRI. The x-ray can define problems and pathologies and I like to call it the poor man's MRI. If you use it appropriately you can come up with a number of diagnostic disorders if you carefully screen the images. That's where we're going to dissect the x-ray and understand what all of these changes mean. We're going to look first at an AP lumbar x-ray. When you scan these images, you should have a typical scan in mind for normal, so things that are abnormal will pop out at you. Uh, for example, the first thing I look at in an AP is the alignment of the spine and the levelness of the sacrum. The sacrum itself should be level. If not, is there a pelvic obliquity due to malformation of the pelvis or to a short leg? Sometimes you can see the hips on x-rays, sometimes you can't on these lumbar x-rays. So you want to have a scan. In the scan, I always look at the pedicles. I always look at the spinous processes for rotation. I look at the alignment of one vertebra on the next. I look for congenital anomalies such as Bartolotti syndrome. We look for sacroiliac pathology. This is a very valuable film to understand alignment, especially scoliosis. This is a, another normal lumbar spine film. The alignment looks to be well. The vertebra are all parallel. The disc spaces are open. The pedicle shadows are all intact. If you look at the intercrestal line, you can see that L5 is below. The intercrestal line runs through 4, 5. Look at the sacrum and the sacroiliac joints. And what I do is I develop a normal dictation so that I can have this running in my mind while I view the film. Uh, this is an AP lumbar x-ray. There's no evidence of scoliosis. Pedicle shadows are intact. There's no rotation. The intercrestal line runs through 4, 5. Sacroiliac joints appear to be normal. Hips are not visualized. If you use that type of dictation, you can visualize a film and in rote terms look for normals and abnormals. Now in children or adolescents they're going to have some growth plates open and you'll notice on this AP pelvis we have this apophysis with this black line. This apophysis is called a RISR4 and we won't bother with that right now that's more for development and scoliosis but you can look at films and determine the age of the patient many times simply based upon these clues. For example, here's another pelvis and you can see again the RISR line or RISR4. On a lateral film, this is probably one of the most valuable films for pathology. If you look, you can see there's a lordosis. You can measure the lordosis if you choose, normal 40 to 60. Very important to look at the alignment of the back of the vertebra so you can look for any displacement fore or aft. For, of course, is an anterolisthesis or spondylolisthesis, and a retrolisthesis is a backward position of one vertebra and the one below. Very important, you can look at the disc heights here so you can determine if there's any degenerative change. This is a very normal film. Probably one of the most important set of films you can get other than an MRI are flexion extension films. And this is because if there's any instability, you won't see it necessarily on an MRI because the MRI image is done in the supine position and there's no motion. The flexion extension images use gravity and gravity can very much determine what is going on. Here's a normal flexion study. What you want to look at is the alignment here. Again, you don't want to pick up any vertebra that's shifting forward or backward. And then on extension, exactly the same thing. Look for alignment to make sure there is stability. You have to start then looking for congenital anomalies or other degenerative changes. Here's a patient, if you look carefully, you'll see a normal transverse process on the right. And on the left, there's this very large transverse process that articulates with the sacrum. This is a transverse alar articulation. Typically, some people might call this a sacralization of L5 or a lumbarization of S1, depending on how you count. This generally means that this vertebra is not moving. 
you can then start to look at the pelvis. Again, the, you still want to look at the sacrum, look for any type of spur formation, and look at the hips. Look at the uh, front joint here, the pubic symphysis, to, for any sclerosis, narrowing, or changes. Look for the, the float, as I like to say, of the femoral head in the acetabulum. The reason why this looks like it's floating is because the hip and the acetabulum are lined with hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage does not show up on an x-ray, and so this float is an indication of the health of the hyaline cartilage. We were talking earlier uh, about mock lines or lines that occur from shadows that make it appear that there is a problem in the spine. I drew this x-ray up because it's a perfect example. This arrow shows here that you can see the pedicle on this side and you cannot see the pedicle on that side. Here you can see the pedicle and then they start to disappear up here. So you might say the pedicle's missing and that's a problem. However, if you look, the tracheal shadow overlies that pedicle, so it's highly unlikely the pedicle has disappeared. Now we're going to get back to the lateral. On the lateral, you can tell generalized disc health by measuring the center of the disc space. If you look here, you can see that the disc heights actually enlarge as you descend into the spine, with really the 4-5 level being the largest, and then 5-1 being about 11 to 12 millimeters. You can measure these heights to determine if you think there's degenerative changes, and this can give you a good indication, as I like to say, a poor man's MRI of degenerative disc disease. Now, typical degenerative disc disease uh, can occur in different forms with narrowing, and in this case, this is called isolated disc resorption. This is where the disc is fully eroded away, and there's no further shock absorption. If you look carefully, you're going to see increased white or sclerosis here of the end plates. This is because they're undergoing great stress due to the fact there's no shock absorption of the disc. If everybody remembers Wolf's Law where bone will depose in areas of uh, increased stress, this is a great example of Wolf's Law. Now when you start to get disc narrowing, on the AP it's not easy to see, but you can start to look for alignment changes. For example here, at L2-3, there is a slight angular change indicating some degeneration on the left side. And 5-1, which is always difficult to see on an AP, still has some sclerosis and narrowing. So you might make a judgment there is some degenerative change of 5-1. If you look at the lateral, again, if you look at the disc heights, and the disc height should cascading, cascading larger as you go down, these get larger, 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 and then somewhat narrowed and somewhat narrowed. So just using the x-ray, you can make an assumption there's some mild degenerative changes both here and here. Again, on the lateral, we can see cascadingly larger disc heights as we go down until we get to L5-S1, which is quite narrowed. And this is not isolated disc resorption, but this is significant degenerative disc disease. Again, another x-ray where we see the cascade getting larger as you descend to 4-5, and then 5-1 where the disc is very narrowed, some sclerosis of the end plates in the intervertebral areas indicating isolated disc resorption.